sorry to those behind the camera. I had some special requests to videotape this evening for people who couldn't be here, uh, including my own mom who wants to watch it. So I'm going to record it for those people and for her. And I'm excited to be with you tonight. This is the first time that we've ever had a dinner accompanying the ceremony that was actually Jewish. Uh, it's not perfectly kosher, but it's pretty darn close. And we used recipes that were very, very faithful to Sephardic Judaism, which is Judaism out of the Middle East rather than Eastern European Judaism. So you won't have any uh, sauerkraut or stewed stuffed peppers or anything like that tonight, but you will have a few things to choose from at dinner time that'll be great. And that's halfway through the ceremony. So to give you an idea of what's gonna go on tonight, we'll go through the Passover meal at least those elements that Jesus and the disciples would have enjoyed together. And in the middle of that is Shulchan Aret, which is dinner. And we will have dinner. You'll take those same plates, so please keep your plates. If you, if you don't, we have some extras. But you'll take your plate up there and get your dinner and bring it back to the table. We will eat. There won't be anything going on up here. You'll just eat together. So don't look to me when you sit down with your food. Just enjoy each other's company. And after a, an appropriate amount of time, I'll send the kids out of the room to hunt down the broken pizza piece of matzah, uh, which you'll understand a little bit later. And when they bring that back, then we will continue with the ceremony and we'll conclude. So it's going to take, I would guess, a little over an hour for the whole thing, but that does include dinner. So this is, if anything, faster than a normal Wednesday Bible study. So I, I think that's a good thing. Before any holiday in the official Jewish calendar begins, there is always the lighting of the holiday candles, the Yom Tov. And those candles are always lit by the woman of the house. And so I asked Kylie, since she was in here, if she would light these for us tonight. As she does that, she would normally sing the Hebrew blessing. Since she doesn't know Hebrew, I'll sing it on her behalf. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kitshanu b'mitzvotav, itzvanu l'aliknesh al yom tov. That means, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us that we kindle the holiday lights. Thank you. And that's all I need. I threw that on her in the last minute. So, some things we need to talk about. On the plates before you, there are elements that signify parts of the Jewish history. But the first thing you need to notice is your cup. Everybody should have a plastic cup. I have a little fancy glass up here. This is your wine glass. Of course, tonight it will be grape juice. But historically, the Jews would drink four glasses of wine during the Passover dinner. And each of those four glasses represented a very significant promise of God, the first one being that of sanctification. And so we will start with the cup of sanctification. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Barei hagafen Amen. You guys can sing that part with me. How many of you know Amen? Amen. At the end of every blessing, I'm going to sing Amen. So you can sing that with me. Let's try it. Amen. Perfect. With that said, you may pour your first glass. I'll ask at least a grown-up at every table to help pour the glasses. Everybody gets one. You can pour them small because you're going to have to drink four of these. As you pour your glasses, let me read to you from the book of Exodus, chapter 6. This is the inspiration behind the four glasses. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out, of, out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. And so that's the blessing in four parts. Sanctification, deliverance, redemption, 
and then finally restoration. And so each of the four glasses tonight represents those four elements of God's promise. The first one that we drink together now is that of sanctification, that God has set us apart as his chosen people. And for us, that means chosen in Christ the Messiah. And so together we'll drink the first glass. After the first glass, normally there would be erchatz, a ritual hand washing. I'm assuming we all washed our hands before you came in here tonight. I hope that's true. If not, let other people hand things out of the dish and you just keep your hands to yourself. But Jesus took this moment in the assembly to do something extraordinary. He washed not only the disciples' hands, but what else? Their feet. Their feet, which was not always a common practice, but it was an option for those hosts who were especially humble that they could wash their, the feet of their attendees. Jesus chose to kneel down and wash the dirty feet of his closest friends, an act that we want to remember at this time when we would be dipping our hands in a shared cleansing bucket of some kind. Thankfully, we have running water and sinks today. The next step would be to dip parsley in salt water. This is called karpas. Karpas just means green plant. Uh, any kind of greens in Hebrew are called karpas. But karpas, in our case, and most Jews throughout history, have been this curled parsley. And that's what you all have at your table. So at this time, everybody get a sprig of parsley, enough that you can eat it. You will eat this part. But you're not going to eat it yet. Hold on to it. As you tear these apart, do I have anybody in the room who remembers the origin of the Hebrew people? how they became a people, and not just Abraham. So they're then Abraham's children. Yeah, so they're Abraham's children, and then what, what happens to them to unite them as the Hebrew people? So they, they have a shared ancestor, but there's an event in their history that sets them apart as a specific people inside of another nation. Exodus. An identity crisis. Yeah, the Exodus, which is precipitated by what? What happens before the Exodus? Slavery. slavery. Yeah, the Jewish people share a heritage as slaves, and it is a key component of their ancestry that they were slaves in Egypt. So as slaves in Egypt, the Jewish people had many tears shed. And so what we do is we take the green, which is already a bitter green vegetable, and we dip it in salt water. That's in the very middle of your dish on the table. And so everybody can now dip this in salt water and take a bite and remember the tears of the Jewish slavery. Anybody think that was really salty? Make you think of tears? Salty tears? Tears of slavery. Allow me to recite the blessing. Baruch Atadonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Bore Pri HaAdama. Amen. And that is, Lord God, King of the universe, thank you for blessing us with the fruit of the earth. So we sang about the fruit of the vine, now we sing about the fruit of the earth as we take these greens, the carpus. These greens are bitter because slavery is a bitter thing. And they're dipped in salt water to remind us that God's people felt the pains of that bitter trial. For 400 years, they were slaves to the Egyptians. And it would take a mighty deliverer to rescue them. And so God lifted up Moses. Before we get to the story, what we call the Magid, it's now time to break the, the bread, this matzah. And so normally there would be a matzatosh, which is like a pouch with three compartments. I don't have one, uh, and to be honest, I don't feel like buying one. They're not cheap. They're uh, usually they're handmade by people in Israel, but it, it really is just a pouch. And all you need to know about it is that in the three pockets are three pieces of matzah, or matzot. And these three pieces 
are separated one from another by some sort of cloth in between so that there are three in one pouch and they talk about the unity to this day uh, most most Jews do not really know what the unity represents. Some believe it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Some believe it's the unity of God and his chosen people, uh, prophet, priest, king, that sort of thing. But those are all rabbinical guesses. We would argue that we know much more clearly what the three pieces of matzah represent. Anybody think you could guess what the three in one might represent? Yeah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And so guess which piece out of... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is pulled out next to be broken. The second piece, the middle piece. And so I would have reached into the Matatosh, I would have pulled out the middle piece, which we would believe represents the Son of God, and at this time I would break it. And having broken that piece, I would take this half and I'll hide it. And in fact, I'm going to ask Kylie for another favor. Would you hide this? This later will be called the Afakomen, which is Greek, not Hebrew, but it means uh, the thing that has to be searched out. And so... If you'll hide that somewhere, later the kids in the room are going to look for that piece of matzah and whoever finds it after tonight, I'll give you a special prize. So this is, this is a tradition, don't, hey, don't watch Kylie, that's cheap. <laughs> this is a tradition that not only includes kids during the festivities of Passover, but it points to a greater purpose later when we find that broken piece of matzah. So I would ask now for the youngest child in the family to ask the Manishtana, which is the questions, the four questions, and they would sing them like a chant, kind of what I was doing earlier. They would sing these four questions, questions like, why on this night do we only eat unleavened bread? Or why on this night do we eat bitter herbs and maror, that bitter horseradish? Why do we eat that stuff and not good, good stuff? And they would explain, we eat all this because of what happened to our ancestors during the Passover. So the four questions, lead to the Magid, the story. And so now I want to share with you some of that story, and I want to look at Exodus chapter 12. And I'll just, I'll just point out a few verses here as we begin to remember the story of the Passover. This is why Passover exists, because God said that they were to do this. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old, or a yearling lamb. God said they needed this lamb because it would be a sacrifice a sacrifice in order to be passed over, thus the name Passover. Does anyone know why they needed their houses to be passed over? An angel of death. Yeah, a spirit of God that brought death to the firstborn sons of Egypt would have brought death to the firstborn children of the Abrahamic covenant, the Jewish people, had they not painted the blood of the lamb on their lintels and the side post of their doors. They did this to protect themselves. The blood became a sign, a seal of God's promise and protection. They needed that protection because God was about to deliver them out of slavery. They had been held under the thumb of a man named Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Yeah, more specifically, yes. Yeah. So Pharaoh, who is the king in Egypt, no longer remembered Joseph or his relatives. He didn't know anything about the Jewish people except that they were a threat. They were growing. No matter what measures they took to stop them, they killed babies and they still grew. It was grotesque, horrible. And they did this, the Egyptians did this, to stop the threat of another group of people taking their power away. People do that a lot. When they want to have power, they do bad things to keep that power. And so the Egyptians did evil things to the Jewish people. But God never forgot his people. And so he raised up a deliverer, an ancestor of Joseph, or uh, an offspring of Joseph, generations later, named Moses. How did Moses get discovered? Pharaoh's yeah, Pharaoh's daughter. He was left in a basket, pushed down the Nile River. He was discovered by Pharaoh's daughter who raised him, and according to Jewish history, not in the Bible, he was raised with the finest education in Egypt. He became a well-respected man in the house of Pharaoh, like a son of the king. But he one day learned about his ancestry about the children of Abraham who were slaves and he questioned why am I here in a palace when my people are slaves and so he went out into the wilderness God met with him he was called and he went forth as God's servant to rescue God's people now he only did this through God's power and that's what we want to remember tonight part of the story is that God intervened that final intervention is in the Paschal lamb the lamb of Passover but he intervened more than one way and before we ever get to that 10th plague, there were nine other plagues. And so I want to pause here and do something that has been done 
for a long time in Jewish tradition. And they'll take, you don't have to do this, but I'll do it for you. They'll take a little bit of wine and they go through all 10 of the plagues and they drop wine into the glass, a drop for each plague with their finger, symbolizing blood that was spilled or pain that was inflicted. And they do this not to celebrate or gloat over the Egyptians, but rather to remind themselves that their freedom came at a cost, even to the Egyptians around them. No one was ever happy to see other people suffer, and that's something we want to remember about God. And so the first plague was the most obvious one, blood, in Hebrew, dam. The second was separiah, which is frogs. The third, kinim, which is vermin. The fourth, beast. Fifth, cattle disease. Sixth, boils. Seventh, hail. Number eight was locust. Nine, darkness. And then finally, number ten, the slaying of the firstborn child. These plagues were not good things. And so as we drip the wine into the glass and think about blood and think about pain, we're reminded that even today, there are Christians all around the world who are persecuted for their faith. There are believers who aren't in air-conditioned fellowship halls laughing and eating things they've never tried before. Rather, they're hiding in basements under the cover of night, studying the pages of Scripture and praying that God would deliver them from their enemies. There are people gathered in mission efforts in closed countries, risking prison day after day so that they can preach the gospel to those who are in darkness. And we want to remember those people tonight, as well as the plight of those who have suffered throughout time. We know God is consistent. He does not delight in the punishment of human beings. Yet when he chose to give life to his people, death was the accompanying result. Those who do not choose life end up dying. We tonight have the choice of life in Jesus Christ, and all people everywhere have that choice. But if they choose not to follow Christ, then we know that the obvious alternative is death. Some elements of freedom from sin and death, some elements of our exodus that we try to connect tonight with the exodus of the Jewish people, involves pain. Sometimes it involves a pruning, a trimming back. There are moments where it hurts to be made into the image of Christ. And yet Jesus said, take heart, I've overcome this world. So when the world fights back, when we feel pain, when bad things happen, we put our hope in God who is good, who is merciful. And so we go back to this text, Exodus 12. They've chosen a one-year-old lamb. It's that final play, the last thing God's doing, inflicting against the Egyptians what they rightly deserve for the way they've treated his people for 400 years. And now his people are about to be delivered. And the final play is the death of the firstborn son. And the only way to avoid it is by following God's provision. Your lamb shall be without blemish. So a perfect spotless lamb, one year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And so that's what we do tonight to remember. Later in verse 12, this is what we read. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so God made a promise. If you will do these things, if you'll trust me and obey me, I will deliver you. I will protect you. And so the angel of death passed. All the firstborn of Egypt and the firstborn of their cattle and their animals died. The Jewish people were delivered from that plague. And next thing you know, they're being led out of Egypt once and for all. And eventually they cross through where? Where do they cross through? A place you wouldn't expect people to walk through. Yeah, the Red Sea. God delivers them again through miraculous means. Always his providential hand guiding them into freedom. And so remembering all these things that happen and God leading them in the wilderness and then taking them into the promised land the land of, of Canaan that had to be conquested with Joshua 
and Caleb. Honoring all those traditions through their history, through the Passover history, they created a song called Dayenu, which means it would have been enough. And to this day, Jewish families all over the world will sing that song in April when they celebrate this Passover. They'll sing Dayenu, and they'll go through the litany of things God did. You could have just stopped there, and it would have been enough. Over and over again. You could have just, and they'll go through all ten plagues, and leading us through the wilderness, through the Red Sea. Flip those around. Through the, through the Red Sea, then through the wilderness, and even into the Promised Land. Any of those things, you could have stopped short, and it would have been more than we deserve. And that song is important for us to remember, because in many ways, God has done far more than we deserve. And in Christ, we have been blessed in ways that outmeasure our earning power. We, we've received more than is due to us. And I think it's good right now to pause for just a second and ask if anybody would volunteer a way that God did more than you needed him to do, a way that he went over and beyond something you're really thankful for. That you would say, if you had just done this, that would have been enough. Diana. Any takers? Saved my wife's life. Saved your wife's life? Praise the Lord. That would have been enough. Just the gift of salvation is enough. Okay. Just to give you a place in his kingdom? Yeah. Yeah. It would have been enough. He brought Jay and I together. Yeah. Brought two people together for love and companionship. That would have been enough. He gave me a son. It would have been enough. I hope, I hope it is enough. You need three more. Let's hear one more. Tegan said he gave us a home. Good, good. That would have been enough. Yeah, if you, if you work backwards far enough, you realize how many little blessings every day we go without thanking God for, things that we're ungrateful for. And that's the point of that song, is to remind families and especially children to grow up appreciative of all that God has done for his people. And he has done much for his people, for each one of us. And so we say together, die in you. It would have been enough. After reading the Passover story, and this process would take quite a bit longer, this meal would probably last a few hours in a Jewish home, just for what it's worth. Uh, but we're fast forwarding, and the things that need to be explained at the table are Pesach, Matzah, and Maror. So I want to mention those three things to you quickly. Pesach is the Passover lamb. That's the one thing we won't have tonight. Now they also added uh, birza, which is like a roasted egg. They added that after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. We won't talk about that because that was after Jesus' era. But in the day of Jesus, they still had a lamb. And that lamb is now represented by a lamb shank because you're not supposed to eat lamb. Some of the rabbis say you don't eat lamb because we don't have a temple to offer it in anymore. That's why we have a roasted egg instead. We're not going to worry about any of that because our lamb has already been offered. We don't need him on the plate, namely Jesus Christ, who has become our paschal lamb, our, our offering, our sacrifice before God. Matzah is the bread, the bread that I broke earlier, and it's a reminder to be ready. They were supposed to eat this bread, unleavened bread, because yeast takes time to rise. They didn't have time to let the bread rise. They had to move when God called them. It says that they ate standing up. They had to gird their loins, which just means wrap their robes up and get ready to run. They had to be prepared to go when God called. After that event, every Passover ever since, they recline at table. In fact, today they'll use pillows on their chairs. Jewish families will put pillows on their chairs to remind them that they're not standing waiting to run. They have been delivered from Egypt, and now they can recline at God's table. And so we recline tonight at table. You have pillows built into your chairs uh, because we have some decent folding chairs. Just imagine those are pillows at home that you've tucked in your chair because you are reclining. And that's the opposite of matzah. But matzah has more than one function. Matzah also reminds us that leaven is equal to sin in the Old and the New Covenant. Paul even talks about that. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. By having unleavened bread, we are saying that we are purified for God's purpose. God is purifying his people. And then maror, the bitter herbs, remind us again of the bitter pain and the suffering of God's people and those around them. That this whole thing was traumatic, the entire event, and that for years people struggled. So, now we will drink the second cup of wine. If you want to pour it. Oh, 
then they took care of it. Let me recite the blessing over the second cup. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, Barei pri hagafen. Amen. The second cup is the cup of deliverance. So not only has God chosen us and set us apart, but he has delivered us out from under slavery. For the, for, for the Israelites, that was out from under the Egyptians. For us, it is out from under sin and death. And so we have been delivered. Now, everybody have matzo crackers in your dish? I know you do because that was the one thing I was in charge of. So get those matzo crackers. I know everybody did all the things I asked. I had a lot of people help me today, and special thank you to all those people. Many of them are back there. But one of the few things I actually did today was put crackers in a dish. So you should all have enough. I went back and added some extras to be sure. Everybody get a piece. It doesn't have to be huge. You only need to dip it twice, two different dippings. So as long as you can break it in half, you have enough. You just need two pieces, two small pieces. And once everybody has their matzah, then I will bless the matzah. Okay, I think that's about everybody. <clears throat> Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kitshanu b'mitzvotah, v'itvanu alei hakilat, matzah. Amen. This is unleavened bread, but it's more than that. If you look at it closely, what do you notice about this bread? Perforated. It's perforated. It's been pierced. All matzah has been pierced. In fact, they use a special tool and they run over the matzah dough and they pierce it with holes. They've done that for centuries. It's all pierced. What else do you notice about the way that it's pierced? It forms something on the bread. Straight lines. Straight lines. Uh, on a flag, what would you call those? Stripes. Stripes. So the matzah is unleavened, meaning it has no sin, no impurity. Chametz is leaven. It has no chametz. It's pure. It is striped and it is pierced. And if you remember, the piece that I was supposed to pull out to instruct us is the middle matzah, which we think represents who? Jesus. Christ. Jesus. Have you put the two together yet in your mind? Yes. Unleavened, without sin, striped and pierced. This is called, in Jewish tradition, the bread of affliction. An appropriate name for bread that represents the Messiah, Jesus. And Jesus took this bread after he had blessed it and broke it. And what did he do? He ate it, that's right. He, he gave it to his disciples and he said, eat this. Everyone, oh my goodness. Every one of you, eat this, for it is my body offered for you. Jesus self-proclaimed that he was the bread of affliction. Not only the bread of life, but the bread of affliction. That in order to give life, he would be afflicted. He would be a suffering servant. And so to honor his suffering and to honor the suffering and remember the sufferings of the Jewish people, we will now eat the maror, the, the bitter herb. So let me bless this maror, that is the horseradish on your plate. Let me bless that and then we'll do that together. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kitshanu b'mitzvotah v'itvanu ala halat maror. Amen. And now take some matzah, dip it, and you're supposed to get a whole good scoopful of horseradish. And in case you were in case you were worried, I did buy the extra hot. Good luck. Did he 
Ada try it? It's okay, Ada. All right. If everybody sits back down, I'll get you to the good stuff. That is the good stuff. Okay. All right, everybody. Take your other piece of matzah, and now you get to enjoy set, which is meant to take the bitterness out of the situation. So God's blessing through the set. The set, which thankfully Kylie made for me, this is the authentic recipe. It's apples and nuts and, and wine mixed, in this case grape juice, and it's the sweetest kind of thing that they had. It's meant to be a double portion, so get a big, big scoop of the sweet stuff. What do you think of the haro set? It's much better, right? If you look at it carefully, it's supposed to look like mortar. It resembles the mortar that the bricklayers use in Egypt. The Jewish people weren't just slaves, they were slave laborers. And they built, they built storehouses. Think about this. They built storehouses for food that they weren't allowed to eat. That's a tough situation to be in. And so they remembered that even though their labor was bitter, it came with the sweet promise of God's deliverance and redemption. And so when they eat this, this bitter, powerful herb, they then follow it with something extra sweet. Because that's the tension of life in a fallen world. It's the tension Jesus felt when he went into the Garden of Gethsemane. He understood, what I'm about to do, I don't want to have to do, but if I drink this cup, I know that good things will follow. Jesus obeyed the will of God. He, he allowed himself to suffer at the hands of sinful men so that the glory would follow. He knew that in order for us to live, he would have to die. And so in order for us to enjoy the sweet stuff, we first have to brace the bitter. And that's the way God often works through his people. Now, it's time to eat. Shachan Aret. And so I think, yes, they're back there, they're ready. If you want to take your plates, you go ahead and get your dinner. There are, let me explain quickly what you have to choose from. There are a few options, and then KFC chicken tenders for, for the, the ones who don't have the nerve to try something new. It's nothing crazy. One is a matzo lasagna. Okay, matzo lasagna. So it's matzo crackers, marinara, a couple kinds of cheese, and shredded chicken. It's nothing, nothing interesting. It's, it's just not leaven. No noodles. Then the second option is, uh, is it the meatballs after that? The next one is meatballs. They're sweet and sour meatballs with turmeric. They taste like really good meatballs from a cocktail party, so you're going to love them. Everybody will get a couple meatballs and then we'll see how much is left. And then the third, third thing over there is potato kugel, which is a really ancient potato dish. It's kind of like potato pudding or something, like hash brown casserole that's fluffier. And it's also supposedly very good from the people who helped cook it. Uh, I was back there, but it wasn't cooked when I was still back there. So they tasted it and said it turned out great. So I think all of it's delicious. If you have kids who don't want to eat any of that, there are chicken tenders and sauce packets. And then there are two authentic desserts. There are macaroons, coconut macaroons with pistachio and dark chocolate. There's only like 30 something of those, so please eat those sparingly if you want one. But there are also pieces of broken matzah chocolate toffee and ice cream. So all of that is open, go eat. Okay. How is everybody liking dinner? Good. If you didn't like it, you probably wouldn't say so. Uh, but I thought it was great. Thank you again. Let's hear for Kitchen Queen. And at this time, before we can continue, I need someone to find the Afikoman, the hidden piece of matzah. Kylie hid it somewhere in the church. All of the kids, anyone under teenage age, so all the younger kids, you're welcome to go right now if you're done eating and start looking for it. Whoever finds it, bring it back to me. So. Uh -huh. 
Okay. Let's hear for Ada. She found the alphabet. Yeah. So, I'm going to go on and talk some, you keep on eating. The Afikoman, the hidden piece that Ada just found, is important in Jewish tradition, but they don't really know why. And I just joked with some people during dinner about that, that some of these traditions, they don't have an explanation. So, the middle matzah, the piece in the middle of the matzah tosh in the pouch, no one really knows why there's three in the pouch. We assume it's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, maybe a prophetic teaching that they still haven't quite grasped apart from the Messiah, but they don't really know. They've come up with guesses as to why that is the case, why we use the middle matzah, why it has to be broken, why it has to be hidden. And then when it's brought back, they don't know what to do with it, so modern Jewish families use it for dessert. They use it often for a Hillel sandwich, which was developed again after the time of Jesus, but they would take the piece of matzah and break it in half and put something sweet between it, like the chayoset, and they would eat it as a sandwich, and it was basically dessert after dinner. So you've had dinner or you're finishing dinner now. We found the afikoman so we can continue. But I want to pause here and, and remind you that Jesus gave that broken bread of affliction to his disciples as a reminder of his own body that would be offered. So even though it is a fun game for a child to find it, we have to remember that it represented Jesus' body of affliction, his earthly body that suffered. Somebody help me connect these dots here. We took an unleavened piece of matzah, meaning pure or without chametz, without leaven, without sin. It was striped and it was pierced, it was broken, and then it was hidden. Where might it have been hidden? If, if it were Jesus. In the tomb. Guess where Ada found that broken piece of matzah? Under the shroud in the tomb for our journey to the cross game. And when it's brought back to the table, what do you think that might represent? Yeah, the resurrection of Christ. Until the Afikoman is brought back, the dinner cannot proceed. Everyone's halted and waiting for a child to find it. Because until it's brought back, we can't go on. And likewise, without the resurrection, there is no hope. But because of the body of affliction and the Afikoman, the, the rescued body from the grave, the risen Jesus, we have hope. And our hope is in Christ, the risen Son of God. So, now you can fill your cups. We're going to have a third glass together. There's a joke among rabbis that you should stop when you no longer remember whether your left hand or right hand picked up the wine glass. That's when it's time to stop. Because they also believe drunkenness is a sin. Before we bless the third cup, I'm going to have a prayer for our meal. They bless the food afterwards, so that's what we're going to do. I'll do this one in English, at least most of it. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who sustains the entire world with goodness, grace, loving kindness, and compassion. He gives bread to all, for his grace is everlasting. And in his great goodness, we have never lacked anything. And we will never be deprived of food for the sake of his great name. For he is God who provides for all and does good for all and prepares food for all his creatures that he created. Blessed are you, Lord, who provides for all. God and God of our ancestors, may you remember us on this day of Passover to bless us with kindness and mercy for a life of peace and happiness through your risen Son, our Messiah Jesus. We pray that he who establishes peace in the heavens grant peace for us, for all Israel, and all of mankind. And let us say, Amen. 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 Yeah, we can sing, we'll sing the last line. O se shalom bim romav, hu ya se shalom alenu, ve al kol Yisrael ve'imru. Amen. And now take your third cup. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, Borei pri ha'gafen. Amen. 
This is the cup of redemption. That cup is most important because this third cup of redemption is the very same cup that Jesus would have shared with his disciples the night that he was betrayed. Keep in mind, at this point, he's already dipped in the maror, the bitterness, with who? The one who dips with me will betray me. Who? Judas. Judas Iscariot. During the dipping in the horseradish, because everybody was screaming and crying, uh, me too, I couldn't tell you this, but that was the moment when Judas Iscariot and Jesus would have dipped together into the horseradish. And so it was a sign not only of the pain of slavery, but even the pain of Jesus' betrayal as the Son of God. And so now is the sign of Jesus' blood, the third cup, the cup of redemption. He, he not only pours this and gives it to them and says, drink of it, it is a new covenant in my blood poured out for the sins of many. But then he says something else, he won't drink it again until he drinks it anew with them. So there is another cup, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Jesus said that the third cup, the cup of redemption, was the cup of his blood. It is by the covering of Christ's blood that we are redeemed. And we can't honor Passover rightly if we don't honor the blood of the Messiah. And so as you drink that third cup, I hope that you are honoring the blood of Jesus, or at least remembering his sacrifice. Before we get to the final cup, there's now a time where we get to sing. Now, we're not going to do that tonight because we don't know Hebrew songs. But they would sing the Hallel, which is Psalm 113 to 118. So you, you have the Hebrew hymn book. It's the Psalms. And it's Psalm 113 to 118, the Hallel, that they use in Passover. Instead of singing those in Hebrew, which we can't do, I'm going to read you one. I'm going to read you Psalm 118. And uh, I'm going to open that up right now and share these words with you. Psalm 118. But they would normally spend time singing through these psalms. The word of our Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress... I called on the Lord, the Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side, it's my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. <laughs> the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? The final line they would sing in this beautiful song is about the chief of the building, or the headstone, the cornerstone, the capstone, that he, the builders, rejected would become the foundation for all that God was building. Once again, pointing to Jesus, who is, of course, the stone that the builders rejected. To this day, Jewish people all over the world will sing Psalm 118 and not recognize that they have rejected the cornerstone that God has built upon. But there is hope for them. And so we not only remember the words of the Psalter tonight, but we think of those Jewish people all around the world who are not followers of Yeshua Messiah, uh, Jesus Christ. We think of those who, who are lost, those who are born under the privilege of Abraham by ethnicity, and yet not of the faith of Abraham unto salvation. And so we think of them and we pray for them tonight. In fact, I'd like to do that right now. Let's pray for Jewish people all around the world. 
Father, we pray that those who are descended of Abraham would believe the promises that you gave to Abraham. That they would look to the better Moses, to the greater Joshua, to the ultimate deliverer, the one who is the author and sustainer of life, who could not be held by death, but lives forever. Seated at your right hand, the Son of glory, the Son of God. I pray that those who are in Israel and all over the world dispersed would come to believe the promises of Yeshua Mashiach, the Messiah Jesus, that they would trust in Him, that they would put their faith in His saving work, and that they with us would be redeemed and brought into your coming kingdom. This we ask in the name of Jesus and through the power of your Holy Spirit. And together we say, Amen. Amen. So, I'd like to read a few lines from Psalm 135 and have you participate. So I'm going to read and then you'll say, For His mercy endures forever. Can you say that? For His mercy endures forever. Okay. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. Oh, give thanks unto the God of gods. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord of lords. To him who alone doeth great wonders. To him that by understanding made the heavens. To him that spread forth the earth above the waters. To him that made great lights. The sun to rule by day. And the moon and stars to rule by night. Oh, give thanks unto the God of heaven, for his mercy endures forever. And now we pour the fourth class. You might remember at the very beginning, a woman had to light Yom Tov, the holiday candles. And that's because it was not through man, but through a woman that the light of the world entered into the world. And I think it's a beautiful thought that I failed to mention at the beginning, that it was Mary, the virgin, who conceived of the Holy Spirit and gave birth to the light of the world. And so women are always honored in the Jewish assembly because they get to light these candles. Even those who don't understand the candle they're lighting represents Christ the light of the world. And so, now we think of Christ for the reasons that he didn't participate in the final cup. So this was the cup that Jesus said he wouldn't drink again. This is the fourth cup. And this is the cup of restoration or final praise. We are not finally restored until Jesus comes back. We await a second advent, a second coming. And in the meantime, we're stuck. We're in the already but not yet era. Meaning we're in the church, we're part of the body of Christ, we have the promise of, of ultimate resurrection and life, but we're still in these mortal bodies and we're still struggling in a fallen world. And so we, like the Jewish people, wait with anticipation for final deliverance, for the second coming of Messiah Jesus. And because of that, he says, I don't drink of this again until I come back for you. Then we'll drink it anew in my kingdom forever. A drink that will ultimately satisfy once and for all. And so thinking of those words in Matthew 26, we lift this glass and I'll offer a final blessing over this juice. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Aharulam Borei Pri Hagafen Amen To God's restoration. Then there's a final prayer, and since we just prayed a moment ago, we won't do that again. Keep in mind, they would have sung a bunch of songs by now and been playing around, and it would have taken a much longer time. So they pray again, and they conclude with a phrase. And you're not, you're not kicked out after this, but this will conclude our service as well. But I'm going to add a Hebrew word at the end of the phrase. The phrase is, L'shana haba Berushalem, which is next year in Jerusalem. L'shana haba Yerushalem. Somebody, uh, actually not somebody, I want all of you to try to say this. Say, Lishana, Haba, Berushalem. Okay, that means next year in Jerusalem. Lishana, Haba, Berushalem. And then we're going to add this word, Ha Chadasha. Ha Chadasha. Yeah. 
Hot Hadasha. That means that means the new one. So we're going to say next year in Jerusalem, the new one, or next year in New Jerusalem, because that's our hope in the second coming of Christ. So, if you will, with me, say, Lashana Habaa Berushalem Hachadasha. You think you can do all that? Okay. Let's give it a shot, and this is going to conclude our ceremony. You ready? Lashana Habaa Berushalem Hachadasha. Amen.